to be in touch with them. They're not plant people, uh -huh. but they're, um, but they might know some of the names of the plants. So I don't I've, know if that's I've gone through many of the Hochuk names with Sheila Shigley, who has been their language person. Oh, okay. I'm Kelly Kincher, and we're at the Wapello Reserve, and I'm an ethnobotanist from the University of Kansas, and here to talk about edible and medicinal plants. For the uh, uh, Omaha, they would view this plant as a um, male buffalo bellow plant. I'm sorry, this is the female buffalo bellow plant because it would flower when the buffaloes were bellowing. Mm -hmm. And the lead plant was the male buffalo bellow plant. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm at this. They recognize male and female forms of plants like echinaceas. Mm -hmm. There were, uh, of, of, a, of one echinacea species, they'd recognize both the male and female form. And occasionally they attribute male and female characteristics to multiple species or combine them. So their taxonomies uh, paralleled ours, but also had differences. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Um, I've written about edible and medicinal plants, and I'm working on an edition of both books. But right now I'm focused on the edible plants. But originally I had 120-some species of native prairie plants and a broad definition of prairie plants, including uh, pigweeds, amaranths, uh, annual sunflower, uh, and then the other end, woody things, uh, plums, choke cherries, all of those are prairie plants. We don't have real big needs on food if you think about it, and variety of food's important to us. We have actually bigger health needs. I mean, I don't know, I haven't quite done this, but if you could go to, let's say, uh, your large super grocery store that has the pharmacy section, are there more things in the pharmacy in terms of medicines behind the counter, in front of the counter, than there are in the food section of your store? Well, in particular, the produce section. Yeah. For yes. Sure, there's more. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Um, also, I can say on my edible plant book, I, I tried everything um, pretty religiously. <laughs> Medicinal plants, I, I couldn't do that, right? No. I mean, there's a lot of plants for, you know, giving birth or menstruation or, or just think of all the sicknesses and diseases we have that you know, are fairly unique, or even things we don't understand, and Native folks had a different conception of medicine anyhow. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a lot of plants, plants used for a whole variety of things, and that explains part of it. And then one other thing is efficacy. Uh, I, I'll talk more about this tonight, but I've done a lot of research, and almost all of the medicinal plants have active compounds. I mean, they have compounds in them that our human bodies respond to. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, almost entirely. They just didn't like, oh, here's plants, just grab them. Mm -hmm. um, and another example of that is grasses, for the most part, don't have secondary compounds. They don't have medicinal compounds. Grasses evolve with grazers. They want to be eaten, paradoxically, mm -hmm. right? right? They want to be grazed and re-sprout. Other plants really don't want to be eaten, and most other plants or forbs have flowering parts on top, so they don't want the tops to be eaten. So they create compounds. Um, so grasses have very few compounds. Very, very few grasses are used with medicine. Just disproportionately low if you just did a random search of plants. So native folks had much more evolved taxonomy. Um, uh, Lakotas had four species to our one species. Mm -hmm. uh, Pawnee had two, and they divided them up on smells and tastes, mm -hmm. which really makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, classic, of course, botany today is all based on reproduction and, and genetics, right? Mm -hmm. Um, theirs were based really much more on uses. Unusual plant, right? Carrot family? Anybody see any carrot parts in something yeah. like this? Yeah, oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a little, bit, a little bit of an humble, maybe, but... Sort you know, of. <laughs> but, you know, not very... Uh, this plant's fascinating in that it has a, a, it a fiber plant. So, you know, the, mm -hmm. the scientific name is Oryngium yucca folium. Right, yeah. Um, and the leaves, basal leaves, are... Um, pretty tough and very stringy and there's fibers in those strings um, probably the oldest use of a uh, prairie plant that we can find is sandals made with fibers of oh. uh, rattlesnake master um, oh. that are I believe 6,000 years old again wow. uh, found in caves we have in the Ozarks we have problems here that you know preservation is pretty tough right yeah. I mean I know there's even some archaeological work done here but if you can imagine if there was you know, a pair of sandals that someone left. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah they're completely gone. 
then also other places that are disturbed, let's say creek edges, not edges, but like open creek, you know, floodplain or river floodplains. For land disturbance, you get more of the annual sunflowers. But the seeds are all edible. Um, they're just tiny, hard to process. Um, but they were processed. And it's another one that you would pound. Pound the whole seed and shell and boil it and skim off the nice uh, oil mm -hmm. off the top and use that for flavor, seasoning, mm. and, you know, oil, oils are great. Yeah, mm. right. Right? So we don't think about all of our sunflowers as, as food. Um, and then, of course, there was great debate on the origin of our cultivated sunflowers. Mm -hmm. um, we now know archaeologically the oldest archaeological remains that are found of sunflowers are like 4,000-year-old seeds uh, that were associated with food in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But the Northern Plains um, has seeds that go back almost 2,000 years. And there's some belief that those may be several, maybe independent origins of these seeds. Uh, the um, Arikara, who I've had some opportunity to work with, when uh, a woman was interviewed who was in her 80s in the 1920s, so she went back to the 1860s, um, talking about their traditional ways, they cultivated sunflowers. And the sunflower seeds were big like ours today, but she said, we also harvest the wild ones. And someone said, well, why'd you harvest the wild ones? And she said, well, they taste better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> More flavor in them. Hmm. Makes me think about wild strawberries, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just that, sometimes those small wild things yeah. just have a lot more flavor. And of course, most of our agricultural practices, <laughs> including Navy practices, select for yield. I mean, that's, that's appealing. Right. Right. Um, and of course, we do appreciate that uh, thinking about something like corn, it's this huge thing today in terms of grain size and cob size that Native Americans mostly develop. If the grain size does not increase that much in the last 20, 50 years, um, it's pretty much Native folks did that. Now there's other, of course, traits being added. But how could that selection have happened from, you know, we're just now figuring out the wild type, but the wild types don't look anything like corn. They're like mm -hmm. just a grass with these little tiny heads with, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 15 kernels kind of stacked. Um, so it's an amazing selection process that uh, went on. And we do know in this region that there are cultivars of ragweeds that were selected for, lamb's quarters that were selected for, um, uh, uh, sumpweed, Iva inua, um, a, a smartweed that was selected for, that we call semi-cultivated, mm -hmm. and at least in some cases, uh, believe it or not, the large seeded uh, uh, tall ragweed <laughs> is extinct. Uh, so there was selection for a larger seeded ragweed that's only in the archaeological record. Mm -hmm. And with lamb's quarters, there's archaeological seeds that have thinner coats that would be better cooked than our wild ones. Mm -hmm. So we see even signs of domestication. Used uh, medicinal plant. Mm -hmm. And it was a cure-all. Used for all sorts of things. Snake bite, which I mentioned. Fevers, colds. Used topically more than internally. Mm -hmm. uh, fresh plant material ground up and mm -hmm. for wounds, for... Uh, things that need to heal um, internally, externally, uh, just use extensively. What we now know is uh, has lots of immune stimulant power. Uh, it has an immune stimulating compound in the carbohydrates, especially the carbohydrates. If you take the plant material and remove all the carbohydrate from the plant material, there's another, at least one more, immune stimulating compound. So it has more than one compound that stimulates the immune system, which um, what that does is the immune system's what uh, get your white blood cells going after bad guys and grabbing them. I'll mention this more specifically tonight because there's even good published literature um, on this, but uh, there's clinical trials that show that you're less likely to get flu, colds, but upper respiratory tract infections by consuming this. Uh, the best studies I like is one, for people flying to and from Australia, you know when you're on a plane, right? Yeah. And the guy next to you is hacking away, because mm. <laughs> we're more conscious of that now with COVID. Um, you know, you're likely to get something. But if you consume echinacea tincture that's made hmm. before, during, and after that flight, your chances of getting uh, a respiratory tract infection is significantly less 
and the duration is significantly less. Mm -hmm. wow. so it's, it's a pretty powerful plant and root. Uh, I've done a lot of work on this plant, and I did write a book about echinacea. Um, but the other part I got involved in was conservation. So echinacea that's uh, used is either cultivated purpurea, echinacea purpurea, which probably would be the one you grow in your garden, although echinacea pallida is wonderful, and I'm basically growing it. Um, but most of the plant material that's used is either purpurea or angustifolia. And angustifolia is out in the high plains, mm -hmm. And it is abundant in places, but there was concern about um, overuse. And I did a calculation once. I mean, there have been millions of plants dug up. So you start thinking about those numbers and it's of concern. So we got involved in work looking at that and it's an amazing plant. If you dig it, dig the top six to eight inches of the plant, half of them will re-sprout. It's an amazing plant. I mean. It's even tougher than dandelions. Dandelions will re-sprout, but if you dig down six to eight inches, yeah, you're going to get your dandelion. But they, they re-sprout. Even and this palata does too. Then some plants, uh, you know, again, go back to your favorite prey plants. You know, many of us like Baptisia, this big wild white indigo. Probably poisonous. It's got rotenone in it. They know what rotenone? Whoa. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Several plants. Lead plant has some too. But pretty small amounts. Rotenone is one of the leading fish poisons. If you live on a farm and have a farm pond and it's full of goldfish or something, they'll give you rotenone, which is coming from a tropical bean family plant, and it will kill all the fish. Really? Yeah, pretty effective. Hmm. Um, so there's small amounts of that in this, so I wouldn't recommend eating it, but it's also bitter, not taste very good. But the plant is a dye plant. I mean, that's, in fact, you can even tell that by, it's, it's a weak substitute for a a blue dye oh, okay. and the plant turns this kind of bluish black uh, as it dries down the pods turn black um, so you can see it has these compounds in it i've been working with someone who's uh, an, an artist that teaches at the ku art school and just really experimenting with all these dyes from plants mm. it is so easy to get color out of our prey plants mm. the harder thing is to get it to be fixed yeah. stay in the fabric and then um, there's so much in terms of mordants and, and changing the colors based on how you prepare the plant, the process you use, and extracting the dye. It's, it's just wild. I mean, mm. it's a fun thing to look at. And uh, one of the people is dyeing some really just wonderful silk scarves with, mm. you know, uh, yellows and, and greens are easy. Uh, historically, too, reds and purples are very hard. And you think about it, what are royal colors? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Those are the valuable dye plant, dye, valuable colors. Spiderwort, when it's blooming, has such a deep purple. I don't know if it stays, but it certainly stains your clothes. That's your right. Hands. That's right. Yeah. So many of these plants provide color, but then getting them fixed in the yeah. Yeah. cloth or clothing is, is the hard part. Anyone here eating milkweed? No, <laughs> never. Yeah. What part yeah. you eat? Uh, the, the pods, have done, I've had them fried and pickled. Oh, pickled? Oh pickled. My gosh. <laughs> I've done the pickle one. You got one on me there. So this one, I'm, one of my, I guess I would say favorite, but one of, one of my more favorite uh, spring foods. Young milkweed shoots when they're only that tall. Oh, yeah. The first leaves coming out. Uh, recommend you boil them, drain it, and boil them again. Hmm. One of the sweetest vegetables I know. Really? And the use of milkweed greens, uh, but more likely, more often still, young pods. So hmm. pods as they're developing, and flowers, flower buds in particular, flower buds and young pods um, are still extremely popular soup for uh, Winnebago in Nebraska, Potawatomi in Kansas, Omaha in Nebraska, and I'm sure other tribes, but still being used by those tribes as a cultural food item. Um, and of course, I talked to some of them and said, you know, I cook these and drain them and don't bother with that. So I assume, <laughs> I assume the young, very young uh, flower, the flower buds and the pods probably have so little of the latex. And then within the latex are cardiac glycosides, mm. heart glycosides, heart. which are not good for no, your heart, actually. No, no. Cardenolides are the compounds. Um, I've had great opportunity to work with medicinal chemists. We've uh, just in the last 10 years, we studied 
this plant and other milkweeds and extracted new compounds. Chemistry work is, is like so many things now. The technical abilities are so great that pretty much any plant that has like a published record of compounds, folks can come in today and find new stuff. You know, we can detect parts per trillion. Mm -hmm. This the chemistry techniques in the lab are astounding. Yeah. Uh, and this, you know, the computer-aided uh, mm -hmm. techniques and such. So we're mm -hmm. discovering new compounds in this. Um, but, you know, there's other uses here, too. The, even the fluff, you know about this? Hypoallergenic pillows are made oh. out of milkweed fluff. Really? <laughs> yeah, you can buy them on the web, even, if you uh, uh, look yeah. for it. And they just take off the seeds, and it, the fluff was uh, used extensively in World War II for a substitute for... I think K-Pac, mm -hmm. but a tropical fluffy material for life preservers. Um, oh. Then it kind of went by the wayside, and of course we have, you know, all sorts of synthetic pillow right. stuff now, and yet there's been a renaissance, and then people are allergic to a lot of those compounds, so um, I've not really slept with a milkweed pillow. I guess I should buy one and try it. <laughs> Long history of uh, Navy folks and us today uh, soaking the berries maybe overnight with no heat. Um, the seeds are full of tannins and the plants full of tannins, but the covering has that lemonade taste. So, unique, nice, kind of fun. Great thing for kids too. Yeah. One other use of it, um, I like dogwood better as a chew stick. Um, mm -hmm. dogwood better, but this yeah. is used as a chew stick, clean your teeth. Oh. Um, what I don't like is more bitter. But uh, essentially, and what I like about the dogwood, I just saw some back there, is it's got a little straighter fiber, but you get as small a stem as you can, and just chew on it and turn it into a toothbrush. Really? And then, so the uh, fibers expand a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they do, and then you can massage your gums and reach back there. <laughs> and I found personally that uh, I keep one in my car. I don't show anyone, but I keep one in my car. <laughs> And I'll just start chewing on it and then rubbing my teeth around it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to thank our sponsors. And um, I'm going to start with the Apple River State Bank, First, Galena, First Community Bank of Galena. They have been sponsoring our educational activities like this for the last four years. And so we're grateful for their sponsorship of our education and outreach program, um, and so we want to thank them. Is, uh, is anyone here from Apple River State Bank? Let's give them an applause. Uh, I also want to thank our friends of Wapello, and if you are or have been involved with the volunteer group of Friends of Wapello, um, this group has been caring for the Wapello Land and Water Reserve just down the road here for the last 13 years. And they're out there every week, every Tuesday morning, um, caring for the prairie, keeping the trails clear so that others can enjoy that beautiful preserve along the Apple River. And last, I want to thank um, River Lights Bookstore in Dubuque. And um, Dina Kurt is here. She's uh, one of the managers at the bookstore. And she is selling one of Dr. Kirsch Kinsher's books, um, The Edible Plants of the Prairie. And uh, I just had uh, Kelly sign one for my daughter, so he's signing those books. And we'll do that um, after. Some of you have already purchased the book, but that will be open after the presentation as well. He's the author of three books. We mentioned the one, Edible Wild Plants of the Prairie in 1987, The Medicinal Wild Plants of the Prairie in 1992, published by University of Press of Kansas, and most recently, Echinacea, Herbal Medicine with a Wild History in 2016. He's also going to talk about this working on a new edition of, of one of his books. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelly Kincher. Uh, my interest in plants goes back to growing up on a homestead farm in Nebraska. I learned plants from my father and uh, 
I spent a lot of time in nature and grew up in Kansas and at the University of Kansas and realized I was adept at learning about plants and kind of delved into that and then had this passion which many of us have today of like foraging and learning about wild plants and wild foods and medicines and realized uh, there was kind of a need for more information on that. And, well, there was a lot of information on donating for people who, of course, are not directly around or we don't see them or we remove them. Uh, we're a source of knowledge. So I delved in the literature and read up a lot and I've had uh, opportunity, a great opportunity to work with uh, quite a few Native folks over the years and I'll share that. It's been a great delight and I feel as I've learned a lot that now I'm in a place to not just share that information but I've been directly involved in repatriating and maturating traditional plant knowledge uh, and that's led me to recently I'm working with several tribes, uh, the Osage, the Ripra, the Oma, and I've worked some with the Hocha too, and now a little bit more with the Dakota. So there's several tribal groups I've been able to work with and uh, help them recapture, relearn, and, and continue to develop the knowledge that they have. Um, so it's a mix of all those things. My research program at the University of Kansas has been broad, but I keep coming back to this topic of ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is really the cultural use of plant materials. And for me, I'm a, I would say I'm a prairie ethnobotanist because uh, prairie's been my focus and love. Um, for that too, I uh, helped found and part of the land trust, the Kansas Land Trust. We've protected over 30,000 acres of uh, prairies and other habitats in Kansas um, through conservation issues. So it's great to come here and see a land trust doing similar work and talking about some of the same things. And then this ethnobotany link and cultural link is really quite heartwarming. So I see the intertwining of, of prairies and ethnobotany, plant use, and education. Um, teaching our kids about plant uses, helping them verbally to learn about the importance of our heritage and, and the knowledge and wisdom of people before us, and then of course of the plants themselves. So I'm going to share some of that. First, I always like to talk about you know where we're from, and as I said, I've been working with the Osage, and well, we're in Osage territory right here. Probably most of you don't even think about that. Then, of course, I'm going to tell you, well, that's not the only tribe whose uh, lands were on. There's an insect, a small insect, showing uh, one depiction of all the tribes who supposedly have territory here. Probably uh, it's a depiction from, I don't know, 1750 or a proposed uh, idea at that time. Uh, the Osage uh, idea is about being here earlier than that. And if we talk about who was here before, really the first question is, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking, you know, 300 years ago? Are you talking 500? Are you talking 10,000? We've had many people here all that time. And I think, I think those of us in the dominant culture now are just starting to recognize uh, that, and whose land we're on, and the idea of land acknowledgement is important, and yet it's confusing. Um, Native peoples didn't divide up territory like we do. They didn't have state boundaries or county boundaries. Uh, for the most part, uh, land overlapped. And it wasn't owned, it was uh, resources. Uh, there was fighting, but more often than fighting, there was sharing and culture groups moved around and groups grew stronger and weaker over time and tribes ebbed and flowed and moved on to different resources. Uh, but all of that in hundreds, thousands of years, so long, long periods of time. So I've been part of the research program at the University of Kansas. Uh, we got a large multi-million dollar grant to look at uh, the medicinal constituents of native plants. And I was very fortunate to work with a very talented medicinal chemist in her lab, and I got to pick plants that we were going to work on. 
So, of course, I focused almost entirely on our native species, and we ended up testing over 200 species of plants for antioxidants, anti-cancer compounds, and anti-inflammatory uh, compounds. Um, so that work is, I'm going to share some of that, because uh, rather fascinating uh, what we did in this combination of research teams to move this work forward. And looking, though, at the use of uh, plants for medicine, one of these talk about conservation. So in putting together a list of plants to study, you just need to avoid threatened and endangered species. You really don't want to make a discovery on plants that you're going to threaten more or have trouble obtaining. Um, so we made sure we avoided that. We tried to have a conservation ethic in the work that we did by uh, harvesting plants in places where we could return or we did not overuse those resources. And then, as I talked about and touched on, you need to have respect for uh, indigenous knowledge uh, of the plants themselves. And then, ultimately, kind of, I see the ecological responsibility for those things we started to make discovery on. We wanted to think about how those plants could be procured or grown so that there would be a supply. Native uh, prairies are rich, rich in their diversity. Uh, this is a picture of a prairie we protected in Kansas, the Aikens prairie, which has over 240 plant species on it, or over uh, 140 plants, 200 species on it, of which on this slide is say 140 species have been used for food. Uh, so mention I wrote that edible prairie, plants of the prairie uh, guide back in 1985-86. I've learned a lot since then. So the new edition I'm working on, which will be out in the over a year, be a while yet, and now over 200 species of prairie plants that were used as food. I've expanded the work by both what I've learned and I've been more inclusive. So things like wild onions, I've kind of gone through the list and realized that any species of wild onion was eaten as flavoring of food. Um, so I've included all of those. And then I've learned a lot more. So I've included uh, more species in that work, and um, I have a wide definition of, of prairie species. So we think about what's, you know, perhaps been planted in a restoration to what you might see on a native prairie. But I also want to point out and I will talk about many things that we might call weeds. Uh, lamb's quarter, pigweeds, annual sunflower, all are prairie plants. I excluded non-native weeds that are animals and others that I want to focus on prairies, but those are native weeds that have valuable food resources. And I also include shrubs uh, in my list of prairie plants, plums, choke cherries, uh, uh, things like that are really part of the prairie. Now in our management day, we want to use fires and kind of like keep out the woodies and I understand that, but they are a part of our prairies of our natural so I take a wide view of what those plants and plant resources are. And of course, prairies are grasslands of the world, um, of North America, and you can see on this map that there's uh, a large uh, green blob to the west, and the biggest remaining portion of at least tall grass prairie is in Kansas, the Flint Hills, but it's been rather degraded. Um, and there's greater diversity of plants as you come uh, northeast, uh, and then, of course, everywhere you see the one picture of all the cropland everywhere, really. Uh, prairies have been lost uh, due to farmland conversion. So it's a threatened plant community, even though it's so large and huge. And what's really been threatened are the high-quality prairies, those that have are most beautiful and unusual uh, wildflowers. There's many sources of information for ethnobotany. There's a Ethnobotany database online, uh, the Native American Ethnobotany database that's uh, been put together over the years. Um, my book's a resource. Um, and then um, we're very much been focused on uh, developing more information, so I'll explain. One of the key characters in kind of the history of ethnobotany in the Midwest, Great Plains, has been Melvin Gilmore. Melvin Gilmore grew up in Nebraska and developed this interest in 
edible and medicinal plants and native peoples and started in the 19 teens and through the 1920s interviewing elders in many tribes uh, Lakota, Dakota, um, Omaha, Ponca, Winnebago, um, Osage, others, and compiled all of that information. Um, into a really wonderful book called Use of the Plant to the Upper Missouri River Region. But Gilmore, uh, unfortunately, died uh, sooner than he had finished publishing and had many, many notes, and I had great pleasure in delving into Gilmore's work. I joke about spending a lot of time in Gilmore-topia as I've gone to archives of his information at the University of Nebraska, the University of the North Dakota State Historical Society, the University of Michigan, and especially at the Smithsonian. So I have copied and photographed uh, lots and lots of his notes, and have found that there were many things that he did not publish or finish publishing, including an entire ethnobotany on the Ripper tribe, which we more recently published. And for that work and the work that I now do with tribes, I uh, contacted and had two Arikara um, researchers uh, join me in publishing that work, critiquing it and adding to it. And I believe that collaborative research is really the way we need to go. This is a copy of Gilmore's book, and I heard heavily into medicinal plants. Uh, Gilmore's an uh, important read, but a difficult read. Um, wrote of the Times, and it's all about a plant, and uh, I'll say it's technical, but it's a little dense, but very, very useful and interesting. He, um, it's a picture of uh, him with a Pawnee elder, and uh, he got to know the Pawnee and went out to their sacred sites in Nebraska, and the Pawnee related to the Arikara, so when he went to the Arikara, he had an end because of his friend, who was an elder and had given him a Pawnee name. So that name was known by the Rick Ryan helped him in his work. And Gilmore was an outdoorsman. I get amused at this picture of camping out in the snow, but like that. In his work with the Rick Ryan, this is like, these are archival things I find just missing. And uh, the woman in this picture is showing these uh, young kids how traditional baskets were made. So she's cutting the, I believe it's, I uh, can't remember in this case, but I think it was ash sticks for this. And even more amazing is Vesticata. The woman here was in her 80s in 1926 when she was interviewed. And so she was a major source of information. And Gilmore was not fluent in Ripper, but had uh, someone help him translate. And, uh, she shared many, many of the plant stories that, that he knew. And this is a picture of her. He took both photographs and uh, some motion pictures of, of things at that time and collected many goods, which were at the uh, Smithsonian Ears of Corn, uh, chuck cherries, plums, all uh, made into hats and patties to be stored for food. That's a tremendous record of information. Gilmore did something that uh, good botanists know about. He even did collect voucher specimens. This is one of them, and uh, this is bee ball that Gilmore collected, and he wrote on it to the uh, Lakota name, Washima, and its use. Um, so he was recording information that can be found with his collections. And I want to emphasize that one of the important things for botanists today is collecting plants. This is just a specimen I collected of. Uh, Buckeye, Ohio Buckeye. And you know, on collecting plants, they're your, they're your thing that provides proof. So if I write about Ohio Buckeye, I can cite this collection, and then you can look at the collection and see what it says on it. And if you are skilled with them, doubts and think it's a different species, or maybe it's changed, maybe the species name's changed, this is the record to fall back on. So it's good to have voucher specimens, and they're important for the work of knowing about historical uses of plants. So again, we do uh, database work, and so I database Gilmore's notes, and this is part of the materials that I'm working to return to various tribes 
and help me keep track of that information as I use it. So back to our research project. So we went to many places to collect plants, many habitats of different sorts of prairies, canyons, out in western Kansas, uh, national grasslands, uh, national wildlife refuges, sources where we could get um, plant material. So for the chemists, um, what they really wanted to test is dry plant material. And they really like a lot of plant material. They wanted two dry kilograms of each plant were being collect. And you know, plants are mostly water. Usually like 80, 90 percent water. So we had to collect 15 to 20 pounds of plant material, which in some cases is easy. I'll show you some of those. In other cases, it was really hard. And we needed to make sure that it was dry, and we needed to make sure we didn't let it mold. Didn't want to have a discovery and then find out later it wasn't the plant that had that compound, but the mold, that would be embarrassing. So again, uh, to do our work, we um, used GPS uh, locations for our accurate data, we collected our specimens, we collected our plant material, we had big data sheets that provided lots of information we thought might be useful um, in the future, so for each collection we had location information, how to go back and get it, things about the plant. Of course, doing field work sometimes it's hard to find a place to stay or a place to eat, especially as rural countryside is struggling, as we all know. Small towns aren't what they used to be, but they're hanging on. So this is a picture of us like, this is what it looks like to try it. <laughs> 20 pounds of many different species. Uh, we quickly learned that we should uh, find good places to work that had storage areas that we could use. We made a mistake early in our work that we were, we'd use motel rooms and go out for the day and turn fans on with, you know, these tarps and plants on them on the beds and come back. Staying at a motel out in southwest Kansas and came back several years ago with regular phones in every room and, you know, the phone had its red light and it was flashing and I picked it up and it was the front desk. And we were one of these uh, hotels that said, you know, uh, Indian, I mean, American owned, but it was immigrants from India, right? And so the guy in his Indian accent said, pick up the phone. He said, I, I said, yeah, I had a message. He says, yeah, you can't do that here. You can't have those plants. That's not legal. So we had a green leafy plant material on the bed. It was not marijuana, but. <laughs> He didn't believe us, we kind of got kicked out. So um, I said, I'm a botanist, this is what happened. So we learned that we needed to use research places or uh, barns or sheds where we could actually lay out plant material and not be bothered by it. We decided we didn't want to keep dry plants, we thought about getting a dryer, um, but to keep the maximum amount of compounds in the plant, we used air dryers, mostly fans. Or, or we got back to the lab, we had, had extensive uh, fume hoods which uh, had passing air every two to five minutes, so that dries things out pretty fast. Buffalo gourd, which is a plant that does make it into Illinois, like on railroad tracks, waste ground, but it's a native plant throughout the plains. We liked it for our collection um, because it's one of those big rooted species. So, you know, something like this, if you're trying to get your weight in plants, it's not hard to get something heavy. The root was used. Just a tremendous big root, which has uh, edible, edible carbohydrates in the root. So you can imagine it's a pretty big food source, traditionally, but it's also very, very bitter, so it needs to be leached and prepared. But even the big root's a problem for us because the chemists want small particles, and you can't just hand them a big root. So we had to cut it up, dry it, put it in a bandsaw, then we could put it through our grinder. Um, so it was quite a big deal. I'll also talk a little about some of the plants we worked with. Uh, this is boneset, and uh, boneset's a great story. It's a medicinal plant. Of course, you think, oh, I know what that's used for. But what it really is used for is uh, the big pandemic in 1918. That uh, the huge flu um, actually, you know, it probably originated in Kansas. If you read about this, and uh, 
uh, some uh, soldiers who are staying at Fort Riley help spread it around the world. As we were in the middle of World War I, and so uh, went from a farm to Fort Riley in Kansas, and then they were shipped out to Europe to um, fight World War I and to spread the pandemic globally. Uh, at least a couple million people died from that horrible flu. And it's a flu in some ways similar to some of the flus we've had where like your bones would ache, right? It'd be just be just achy, right? Well, bone set uh, helped get over that. Bone set helped alleviate what was called the bone break fever. And bone set has uh, immune stimulating compounds in it. And so they actually were uh, herbalists uh, and doctors at that time. They used a lot of herbal products for recommending bone set. And people got over their symptoms of that fever, at least in some cases. Other plants names are more confusing or don't mean as much, but the big lobelia we have around here, my big lobelia, is Lobelia syphilitica. Well, it was used to treat syphilis, but it does not appear to be very effective. That use has pretty well disappeared, but the name has stayed with the plant. Other things we've collected, something that's really odd at the prairies is this daughter. Cuscuta, which is a parasite, and it does not make its own photosynthesis. It's the orange stuff in that picture. And it is species or a group of species specific. So there's like one that likes sunflowers, and there's some like other species of plant, like legumes. And they get all their nourishment off those plants. Of course, they have to find that plant within a few days of germinating, and they'll die, because they only live off other plants. Well, this plant exchanges body with fluids with other species, which we know is dangerous. And there's some research that so this plant has a lot of antibiotics in it. So we thought, oh, this would be a good one for us to look at it, you know? But it's these threads. And these threads are like string. They don't weigh anything. So it took us a really, really long time to collect enough and dry it. And in telling you some of our results, it didn't have any big value to us, right? So it's science is, right? Work and discovery. And a lot of opportunity work in Colorado, and these little blanket rolls are uh, a way we bring back plants that weren't quite dry, and we roll them up this jelly roll um, and bring them back to our lab where we can dry them. This is what a lab looks like, sometimes drying plants in it. It's spread all over the place. But as I said, we collected over 200 species of plants, and as they were processing them here, those bags of that and dry. That uh, grinder is uh, widely known. One of the things difficult about doing science is equipment's expensive. That's a $20,000 grinder. It's just a blender on the steroids. Um, <laughs> But using a tool like that, too, I'm going to be very careful to clean it. Um, so many of our plants are really sticky. So like if you grind up goldenrod or asters, there's a lot of resinous material on those. And it would stick inside the grinder. We had to remove that, clean the grinder thoroughly, because again, we don't want a discovery of some plant to be really leftover material from some other plant. So we had to put quite a few links to do that. And this is how our material looks. This is the Gara. Um, that, that's uh, two kilograms of ground plant material that the chemists would use. You see bags and bags of plant material. So, coming forward, of all of our plants, mostly all prairie plants that we looked at, be leading uh, candidate for both antioxidants and anti cancer was what I now call the wild tomatillo, or something my like nose, the ground cherry. Another weedy prey plant, you know, if you started asking people what's your favorite prey plant, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would say, hey, that wild tomatillo, that's what I like best, but you should. Um, of the two species of plants we tested, the first clue we had to this was an important plant was it was the highest in antioxidants. Um, antioxidants are, we know those as like vitamin C and um, they're very helpful to us, and they also 
uh, are related to um, uh, dealing with inflammation and are also viewed very positively as being anti-cancer. So this project we're working on, we also involved our medical center, and they said, you know, we'd like to try that one and see how that works in our anti-cancer screens. And it scored exceptionally high in the anti-cancer screen. So they're pretty excited about it. The chemists at KU started uh, working on more of extractive compounds and finally came up with a, a series of compounds that were creating that activity. And as they were getting those extracted, the folks at the medical center were doing other tests, and including, you know, there's always tests on animals which are not entirely comfortable with, but we, uh, they had rats that had uh, tumors and by giving them this compound from this plant, they actually reduced the size. So we were very excited about that. The chemists had realized that this was an important compound, so we submitted that to publication and said it has its efficacy with uh, cancer, it was promising. And I didn't know this before I started with chemists, but new discovery, you're the ones who get to name compounds. So my colleagues named these compounds Jay Hawkins uh, in reflection of we were the Kansas Jayhawks. The paper was accepted, but the editor said, what's this Jay Hawkins stuff? <laughs> so I was looking at the school's mascot, it was actually an anti-slavery mascot, you know, it's a good thing. Um, so these compounds are now called with analytes. Which relates to there are also related compounds in another plant called Lithania. It's a much less interesting name. The work continued on this and come to find out that the berry, actually a fruit within that Tos tomato, the tomatillo, uh, also had these compounds. And I have requested we look at that because they've been used extensively as food. In fact, they're very tasty. Um, if they're right. So, when I wrote my first book, uh, I was pleased to say that I've actually tried all the plants that I've written about. And so I tasted these wild tomatillos and I thought they were okay, but not really very good. And I didn't write that in the book. I didn't say these were okay. But, you know, it's kind of like you're positive on what you're working. So, you know, I'm going to get edible. This research project, though, made me realize I was eating green fruit. So we got collected a whole bunch of these fruits because we were testing them and we were curing them up, and so we ended up growing uh, big plots of them and harvesting the fruits and wanted to try so the chemists didn't have to use dried fruit. So I had hundreds of them, maybe thousands of these fruits just laying out and they didn't dry. After a whole month, those fruits just sat there. They didn't mold, they didn't rot, they didn't dry. So we realized we should cut them up, cut them in half. But I also noticed that just a few of them were getting yellow. I tasted them, and it was like, oh, these are sweet, these are good. Be a little bit like, you know, if you didn't know anything about tomatoes, you know, the first time you grew them, got some nice big green tomatoes, and you thought, oh, good, I think I can eat. And you'd bite into a green tomato and you'd go, these aren't very good. <laughs> but they're right. Same thing. These are related closely to our tomatoes, actually. Um, in the same family, nitrate family. So the ripe fruits have a long history of food use. Just delve into a little bit of it. The green is the range of wild tomatillos. The uh, red dots are just a few of the archaeological sites where the seeds of wild tomatillos show up, and there are some numbers related to tribes in which we have documentation that they actually ate these as food. And now I've delved in more, there's probably hundreds of archaeological sites where these would be found or in, or in the remains. Um, green sauce goes way back. People made tomatillo sauce way, way back. The hot pepper part of it's more recent, but going way back, it's been a flavorful tomatoes and sauce. I'll make green tomato sauce to look at it that way. And it's used in, you know, for food, you know, if you had a, uh, a dish of corn or something, corn and beans, based with squash, you just put this nice sauce over the top. Or if you're making a bison stew and wanted to check it out, get a little different flavor, you'd add some of this sauce. 
So they would harvest large numbers of these. They would mash them into packs, like fat pancakes and dry them. And uh, those were recorded in a lot of the old historical literatures of food. And then archaeological sites. Um, you know there's a long history of burning food. Who here has burnt food, right? And people, you know, cooked over open fires. They burnt food even more, right? Um, burnt food makes burnt seeds, and if you carbonize seeds, they are, will last for eons, practically, or at least centuries. So it's very hard to get archaeological food remains here in the Midwest Great Plains, because things rot. We have really good decomposition. So it's hard to find things, but if things are carbonized, they show up. So many archaeological sites, you find this as food. So we had this food, and then the good thing with that is it made me realize, wow, this is a healthful thing, full of antioxidants. Maybe people's eating tremendous amounts of this. That's probably one of the reasons they were so healthy, is that they were eating these wild foods that offered this greater health. The story of the anti-cancer became a little disappointing, a couple levels. The anti-cancer reduction tumor part didn't last. The, the tumors grew again. Uh, the chemists tried a bunch of other formulations of that. You can attach little OH uh, rings on the outside. You can mess and tweak the chemistry. Sometimes you can make it more uh, uh, absorbable by the body. Not that quite seemed to work. Um, discoveries still look promising. Very expensive research. We couldn't get additional funding for it. It wasn't promising enough for a pharmaceutical firm to take interest. Um, so still kind of out there as some potential, but didn't, didn't quite happen. So that's the tomatillo story. Um, other plants, wild roses, we saw some today on the prairie. Uh, food source, all rose petals are edible. And of course, rose hips have a long history of being used as uh, food. Um, not always desirable, the seeds of <laughs> <laughs> Indian grass. Rose hips are used as a food, um, uh, not a favorite food always, but also as a flavoring. And uh, the inner bark of roses. Thank you. Okay, the inner bark of roseberries is uh, uh, Irish. Is Irish. Traditional people had lots of problems being around fires. Eyes were tired and sore, the smokiness, you know, of being around fire. So, long answer to that. Venture plums, plums are a long term food source. Of course, the smell of the flowers in the spring is wonderful, and the fruits laid down on the bushes. Uh, used extensively, they used it in pemmican uh, at times, which is a uh, dried fruit, dried pound of meat, fat um, put together. As a Good food source. Bee balm. Bee balm is a wonderful plant. Smells great. Mint. Long history of its use. Uh, primarily for like rough throats, sore throats. Still use that way to do a really tough sore throat. Drink some bee balm tea. It'll, it'll definitely soothe it. Um, this plant was uh, known by many tribes, and several of them had many names for the plant because it had different smells and tastes which are used to separate it into uh, different varieties or species. Still an important plant, Potawatomi, this uh, picture we did to work up the Potawatomi Reservation, and uh, Bernard Cox in the center was delighted that we could pick uh, bee balm for her. On the dry side of things, uh, prickly pears. Um, edible fruits, edible tags. Of course, the problematic part is uh, the spines. A lot of what we need to do or think about is, well, how do you deal with these things? Well, you can easily remove the spines by burning them off. Just holding the fruits or old tongs and then those little spines, the small ones, just melt in the heat. Then they become good fruit to eat. The big seeds, the other seeds. Another plant that uh, probably is here in this part of the lung, it's up in the Driftless area of Wisconsin. Um, so it's probably, probably a very here too. It's a prairie turtle, which you can't even hardly see in that picture, but it's the form of the spreading leaves. 
and it's known more for its uh, big root, really a nice starchy bean family root. Prairie turnip, I like calling it tipsu, which is a derivation of the Lakota name for the plant or root. This was the most widely used food across Great Plains, Midwest Indians. All tribes used it, where they could find it, would dig up these roots. They were dried, they were used much like you might think of potatoes or white rice used. In fact, the uh, Dakota name for the plant essentially translates as the little wild rice of the prairie. So it's just like wild rice as a starchy, grain-like uh, food. They were grinding it up and use it as a potato or you know, rice um, and add it to soups or stews. Um, use it any number of ways. It was so important that summer rice hunts by Plains tribes were where, the, where they would go to hunt rice was where the women uh, would be able to gather prairie turnips and chip churches. They would camp there and the men would go out from there and hunt bison, they'd dry the prairie turnips, chuck cherries, and then dry the meat, and come back, back to the villages. Been a pleasure to work with many uh, Native peoples, and I also like to honor uh, Haskell Indian Nations University of Lawrence. I've had many students uh, from this pan uh, tribal school in Lawrence, one of the two federally uh, Pan tribal schools in the U.S., um, which is in Lawrence, so we get a chance to work with them a lot. Let's get forward slide. This is uh, up on the Cutter Reservation, which I've done the work up there, um, and they still have these prairie turnips. One thing I want to say is, from the traditional use of plants, much of what I talk about is historic, because I like a lot of historic documents. But these these traditions are still alive. People are still using prairie turnips. Even though we don't know about them as a culture, um, these are still an important food source uh, for native peoples. This picture of Alma Snell of the Prairie Reservation. She did a book uh, called The Taste of Heritage, which is her cookbook. Uh, little recipes of edible medicinal plants. I got to know Alma and uh, wrote the crafts for her book. Um, it was a great delight in working with her, and one of the difficulties we had in ethnobotany circles is we're likely to know what plant was used for what. Um, and we had very few recipes. Um, so when things were cooked, we didn't know how they were cooked. Or even worse, with medicines, we didn't know how they were prepared. Often we don't even know whether there's a root or the top or what part was used. Rather frustrating. This is a uh, very fond lily, Erythronium's uh, relative of uh, trout lilies or doxophyllids. Um, this one occurs a little bit here in Illinois, but mainly further west. But these uh, bulbs um, were pit bait. There are a lot of things that were pit bait. Uh, we talked about them being uh, wild chemus, uh, camassia out in the uh, Wapalo Prairie. Uh, was another root that would be pit baked. And pit baking was essentially building big fire, heating rocks really hot, putting in some green leaves, and then putting in your bulbs to roast. Covering it up with both leaves, more hot rocks, covering the whole thing with dirt, and this oven was allowed to bake for like three days. And then you'd uncover it, and the bulbs would be soft and sweet. The slow cooking, pit baking, uh, converts more of the carbohydrates into sugars, so made for really sweet roots. And a lot of plants are used that way, but we don't have really good records of that. A lot of starchy roots were, were baked. Well, echinacea is my favorite wildflower. Um, this is echinacea industrifolia from the west, which is a leading wild plant used as, as medicine by Native Americans, but all the echinaceas were important medicine the native peoples, really throughout the whole eastern United States. Um, this western species grows in very dry, rocky habitats, but the echinacea palette, which I've been here, um, is much more widespread. All of them uh, were not only important to Native Americans, but are important herbal products today. Been a long history of harvesting uh, snake roots, pictures from the 1950s. Even last year, just a uh, 
pre-pandemic, uh, uh, I ran across a root buyer in Kansas. But roots first. Um, so there's been this long history of people harvesting roots, recreation roots, selling medicinal plant trade. But there's been concern about the millions of plants that have been harvested, but that might affect populations. I believe in working with traditional people. And traditional people are those out there harvesting roots, whether they're Native Americans or uh, Americans who've been around only a century. So we went out with diggers for these roots and found out how they worked, and they started telling us, you know, we can go back these patches about every three years. We've been harvesting roots in my family for 80 years, and it just keeps coming back. So well, I thought at first, well, you know, you just don't see all the plants, and there's little ones, and so we're probably just missing quite a few of them. The guy said, no, no, it, it re-sprouts. I was kind of skeptical. Um, so we went out with him more and found out that the uh, roots did re-sprout. We found out that about 50% of the plants that were dug re-sprouted. So echinacea has a tremendous Update to do that. In fact, if you think about plants in your yard, there's hardly any plants in the yard that you dig down six, cut them off six to eight inches below ground, and they come back. I can kill almost everything in our yards. Even our native plants. You know, they'll come back in three or four inches, but not quite that deep. Um, so we're out remarkable. So we felt the conservation side is pretty well taken care of. And there's been very good work on echinacea. It's one of the Clinical trials, randomized tests. I like this one a lot. This is about air travelers that fly long distance to or from Australia. And you know, if you're flying long distance, you know you're at risk, right? For the guy next to you that's hacking away, right? I mean, you're just in that closed space. So they just studied two groups, the group that did consume an echinacea tincture, that's a water and an alcohol extract. Uh, made by an Australian company. They consumed that before, during, and after their long-distance flights. They were statistically less likely to get the upper respiratory tract infections. And that they did, the uh, amount of time that they had it was uh, statistically less. So proving that, indeed, with that condition, there's some efficacy in the traditional uh, practices. So in sharing this, I'm kind of wrapping up here. I just want to make the point that uh, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that natives have about our native plants for food, for medicine. Uh, a lot of that knowledge is still with native people. Um, there's a lot we still to learn today about what they do. There's still a lot of historical records. There's a, kind of a renaissance of uh, desire to learn and even share traditional knowledge by native people. And now many of us are recognizing the value of is really a great thing, and I really commend people here as you're thinking forward about culture and nature and your center that you're going to build and trying to make that work in all these different ways. It's really, really significant. So I've had a great pleasure doing gardens, and I want to talk about a little bit of education and gardening and science. We have a research garden um, at the university that's where we grew out a lot of our especially when we were uh, trying to maximize the production of buildings. In some cases, it was easier to grow 20 pounds of live material than to collect it. Or for things that we had success with, we needed to grow more of them. Um, one of the things I've shown you is that with many of our baby plants, which are really, really tough, it's really surprising how easily they get disease or insects when you grow them together. So part of what nature's about is diversity. A very important thing. If you crowd things together, it's not surprising that you have more pests or diseases. So we have a research garden, and uh, my colleagues in the School of Pharmacy and Medicinal Chemistry have a very nice building. We're involved in helping create the garden uh, for them. So the School of Pharmacy has uh, a medicinal plant garden. And I'm also pleased to say that this past year, the University of Iowa. Uh, installed a medicinal plant garden at its school of pharmacy. Actually, it's a long tradition. Um, this picture on the lower left is our K drug garden from the 
1940s. Um, so there was a history of this idea of growing uh, plants, and we tried to replicate uh, the plants in the drug garden that was originally at KU, in the little garden which we're doing now at the university. We had to skip a couple of things. Uh, we decided we would not grow the opium poppies or the marijuana. Um, both are semi-illegal, and the Kansas marijuana is definitely illegal. Um, I've been ready to disappear in the middle of the night legal issue. Um, we've also focused a lot on signage, and I find that signage is a really important way to reach people. So in our gardens, we have a large series of small font signs. Of course, it's the Athanasia sign. Uh, in that special school of pharmacy, we list when it was in the national, form form national formulary or U.S. pharmacopoeia, because those at one time were really kind of the, the guiding Light of pharmacists. Um, and then we've also tried to list native American uses to make sure that's part of, of what we've done about these plants. I skipped the slide, but this uh, slide will next show the uh, Katie Drug Garden. And this one shows the original garden with the big patch of marijuana in the back, which was considered a good research topic uh, at the time. I'm not the biggest proponent of, of marijuana, but it really does need some research and discovery. It's kind of embarrassing as a scientist that it's been a taboo topic. Finally, we do tours too, and uh, if you ever find yourself uh, coming to Kansas in uh, late spring or up in the fall, we kind of postpone doing these tours during COVID, but we uh, very much enjoy doing these garden tours. And lastly, I'm going to put up my website and tell you we have information online too, which you're welcome to look at. And I would very much enjoy uh, taking some questions. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, a lot to digest here. But, uh, Um, I did want to end with one story that's related to what um, Kelly has been sharing, and that is um, work with indigenous communities. Uh, today is a day that's being reclaimed by many communities as um, Indigenous Peoples Day, reclaiming it from Columbus Day, and um, one of the ways we wanted to be thinking about that was bringing Kelly here to talk about the work he's been doing with tribal communities and with plants that we have in our preserves. So thank you for weaving those two ideas together so nicely for us, the science side and the cultural side. This is where I see our work going in a lot of ways. Last evening, um, Tom Clay, one of our staff members, and I had the opportunity to meet with um, Sap and Fox and the Squawky Elders at our Calf, Casper Bluff uh, Land and Water Reserve. Um, we met with two members of, uh, well, we went with uh, the elder of the fish clan of the Meskwaki, who is cousins with the elder of the fish clan of the Sack and Fox. So two closely related groups, Sack and Fox um, of Oklahoma and the Meskwaki tribe in Tama, Iowa, about two and a half hours west of us. We also met with the member with the um, elder of the Fox clan of the Sack and Fox, um, as well as with their tribal historic preservation officer. And um, we started, it was, it was interesting, and just sort of by happenstance, that I was trying to think about how do I reintroduce these people who were native to this land, to this land. None of them, of the five men who were there, none of them had been back to their ancestral lands in Northwest Illinois. So just think about that statement for a while. Um, they lived on this land for hundreds of years, they consider this um, one of their ancestral homelands. 
and they had never stepped foot here. So how do, how do we welcome them back? So just so happened, I picked some bergamot, some bee balm, and some uh, wild um, mountain mint is what I call it. What's the scientific name? Pigmentum. Pigmentum. Um, and put them in a little glass, like a little bouquet, and um, I welcomed them back to their ancestral homeland. And I said, I want to reintroduce you to a smell that maybe your ancestors knew well, walking through the prairies this time of year or any time in the summer. Those of you who have walked through a native prairie in the summer, you know that smell when you step on one of those plants. And um, <laughs> I've done this a lot with people, but um, I've never had this experience. Most people are kind of shy about smelling things. And kind of, these guys, all five of them grabbed it and just... And, um, and two of them said, I know this plant. My grandmother used it to heal me when I had stomach aches. And I thought, wow, um, that was a powerful connection for them to this place. And it was also sad to me that they've been disconnected from this place for hundreds of years and disconnected from that plant. They're now in Oklahoma. Um, and we went on to have um, really interesting conversations, set of conversations, and, and I'll boil it down to this. Um, they thanked me for reintroducing them to their homeland. And I just found that really odd. But they were sincere about it. And then a group of people arrived just people coming up to see Casper Bluff. And it was incredible to watch them, these five men, complete strangers, welcome this group of strangers to their homeland. It was that instant for them. And um, I mean, I just get shivers thinking about it. But that's the work you're doing with us. That's the work um, that's ahead of us. And um, Kelly, I just want to thank you for helping set that stage for us and encouraging us to continue this journey with um, tribal partners that trace their heritage to this place. And um, I love the idea of having a medicinal and food garden with traditional names and maybe traditional recipes, um, uh, traditional cures. That's all coming, right? We can see it coming. Um, and um, so I invite you to join us on this journey. There'll be more of these kinds of um, events and speakers coming our way over the next couple of years. And thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this community. And um, thank you. Tonight, as you're leaving, about the indigenous people of this place and how we can welcome them back. Thank you very much.